when you're doing astrophotography, sooner or later you'll be bitten by the need for speed. And by that I mean the speed at which your telescopes gather light and put it onto your camera sensor and the camera sensor pixels. And uh, this is measured by the focal ratio of a telescope. And the lower that number is, the more speed the telescope has. And of course, the faster your telescope gobbles up photons, the better the signal to noise ratio you have for a given integration time. And so fast telescopes, they're very much in demand and they're usually very expensive. And so that need for speed can prove fatal to your wallet. Today we're going to talk about how I felt this need for speed and what I'm doing about it. Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today, as I said, we are going to mention the need for speed which every astrophotographer will feel just like visual astronomers will feel the need for more aperture. Aperture fever for astronomers, we have um, focal ratio fever or speed fever for astrophotographers. Now, as an introduction, focal ratios, how do you compare focal ratios? For instance, this telescope here is a Celestron C6. It has an aperture of 150 millimeters at the front. And um, if I put a camera at the back here, it's gonna give me a focal ratio of F10. Okay, on its own, that doesn't really mean much. And the, uh, the focal ratio is really just the focal length of the, the telescope, how much it zooms in, divided by the aperture, how much it can efficiently gather photons for your camera sensor in the end. Um, if I were to uh, use a system called Hyperstar that allows me to put a lens instead of a mirror here, I could switch this telescope from being F10 to F2. So what does that mean compared to F10? It means that my focal length would be much less. It would be diminished to 300 millimeters, just like a small refractor. But it also means that it will gather light 25 times faster. How do I know that? It's simple. You take the square of each of those focal ratios. The square of 10 for F10 is 100. The square of 2 for F2 is 4. Divide 100 by 4, that's 25. Therefore, F2 will be 25 times faster at gathering signal to noise ratio than F10. So it's a huge improvement over F10. And even, even compared to the refractor that I use right now, which is F4.5, the square of that would be around, let's say 20. It would still be um, almost five times faster than my refractor. So it's a big improvement. And my, recently, I was without really a telescope for a bit of time, and which is why I really got bitten by the need for speed. And the way that I decided to deal with my need for speed is to go with this little telescope along with what we call a Hyperstar lens at the front. The Hyperstar is really a brand name that's made by Starizona that, as I was saying, changes your telescope uh, for uh, from F10 to F2. It's available for Celestron C6 to uh, C14, I think, not completely sure. And there's also um, telescopes called the Raza series, um, like the Raza 8 and the Raza 11, uh, that are available that provide native F2 speeds. Um, and they provide that with minimum tinkering. Uh, so they're so they considered like superior to hyperstar solutions because they do one thing and they do it well, or that's how we look at it. So I was very tempted actually by the Raza 8, but then I looked at the prices in Japan. And unfortunately last year, the reseller for Celestron products in Japan changed from, I believe it was Citron Japan, and it switched to Vixen. And a lot of Celestron products uh, saw their prices, which were already higher than US prices, jacked up by between like 30 and 60% or even more. Um, so yeah, the Raza 8 was super expensive. And so I didn't go uh, that way. So anyway, I decided like, hey, let's not go for a Raza 8. Let's go for something that's actually smaller and lighter. So not just the price, but also convenience. Uh, this C6 is smaller, lighter, shorter, and just more compact, more like easily more easy to handle than the Raza 8 in general. So I can take it on trips with me. And there is a Hyperstar lens available for the C6. One of the main issues that I would have with the C6 or with any um, telescope 
uh, that I convert to with hyperstar to f2 is that I need a proper way to focus the telescope and the proper way to focus the telescope I decided was a Celestron focus motor uh, which costs in Japan uh, thank you Vixen twice the price of the United States basically and I bought the actual c6 used um, and I bought it used it was an excellent quality c6 really really impressive um, so that was good but then I needed to get the Hyperstar lens. So I contacted Starizona to ask about lead times and some details about collimations and filters, that kind of stuff. And they answered and they said, no, we're going we're gonna to send you a Hyperstar C6 version 4 for free. Okay. And then the day after, they sent me another email. Actually, we've changed our minds. We're going to send you that for free, but we're also going to send you more goodies for free and there are no conditions attached so you can't you don't have to make videos about those products you don't have to show you yourself using those products and if you talk about those products you don't have to talk negatively or positively about them at all you do whatever you like so really no strings attached so kudos for star arizona uh, for that and i i got a huge care package like awesome stuff but today i'm going to concentrate on the actual hyperstar which is this in this box. So we have Hyperstar for C6 telescope uh, version four, which uh, supports up to APS-C sensor sizes. I'll be using it with just uh, the one inch sensor of my 533 MC Pro, at least for now. And with that, they sent me a filter drawer. And uh, this filter drawer is for supports two inch filters. Um, and uh, it's made so that the I have the exact like by just like screwing in my 533 MC Pro in there, it will have the exact correct back focus. So I don't have to think about back focus at all, which is awesome, absolutely awesome. So I have this, and they also sent me additional drawers for if I want to use multiple filters one after the other. And like there's even like this uh, this kind of like drawer shelf, like bookshelf for drawers that is seems to be 3D printed and you can actually like remove drawers. It's, it's super cool. Let's see how we set that up. So I've now opened my C6 and you can see we have the secondary mirror that is here. And with the um, Hyperstar, because I actually read the manual, I actually know what I'm going to see. Um, yeah, we have the link to the manual, manual here, but we also have a little um, attachment plate with a knob that can actually be replaced this little plate here so that you can more easily switch between a Hyperstar and, um, and the secondary mirror for like visual use of your telescope. For me, I'm probably going to do more or less a permanent uh, change of this telescope. So, I am not going to put that little drawer on uh, because it, it looked a bit like difficult to do, at least for people like me. And then we have the actual Hyperstar lens. And this thing is designed in a super cool way because at the bottom here, there is a, a, a small like container for your secondary mirror once you've removed it. So I can just remove this ring here in the middle of my mirror. There it is. And then I can remove the secondary mirror, which is here. And I can place it in the little drawer. And with the retaining it ring from the, uh, the secondary mirror, I can secure it in. And here we have it, a nice container that keeps, keeps my secondary mirror safe for me to use anytime. Now, the, uh, some Celestron telescopes, the secondary mirror here is not well centered compared to the primary mirror. And with uh, my C9.25, for instance, there are actually worm screws on the top here that can be used to adjust the centering of the secondary, uh, uh, of the secondary to the primary. And this is actually fairly important for hyperstar collimation. Now, I looked at my own C6, which does not have screws for adjust adjustments. Um, and I link to a page down below about how to do those adjustments because you want to be very careful. Uh, but I looked through the hole there and I'll put a picture uh, of that now. And you'll see that for me, they were, uh, the, it's pretty much perfectly centered. 
So now what I can do is I can simply insert the hyperstar in and screw it in. And that's pretty much it. So <laughs> this is actually the first time I'm doing this. This is so cool. Uh, yeah, the, the hyperstar is here. We have the corrective lens here and then I can just uh, screw in my uh, filter drawer. And then I can remove the cap here and screw in my camera with the uh, 11 millimeter adapter ring here. And here we are. We are done with setting up the Hyperstar. So the next step will actually be a collimation because we actually have a series of push-pull um, screws here that can be used to to collimate the Hyperstar. I am not sure whether I am going to need to do so because the um, the secondary is so well centered compared to the primary. So we'll see. But now I am basically ready. Now the astute among you will have noticed some obvious problems or problems with this setup. The first one is that I can't really close this uh, telescope anymore. Um, so I will need to find so I think I will have it like permanently with some kind of um, hood that goes beyond the camera and where I can actually put on the cap after that. And uh, we'll see how well that works. And another problem that you can see with this setup is um, that while we have the same diameter for the camera and the filter drawer here, there is a screw that is protru protruding here, which I think might hurt a little bit the, uh, the star shapes. So we'll see what comes out of it. And also I have cables that I need to route to some computer or something that will take the actual images at the back of the scope. And for that, I have the power cable and the USB 3 cable and I'm braiding them together uh, so that I can like use them uh, together. I need to be able to remove the filter drawer whenever I want. So I can't make those cables basically go over the screw in this direction because then I cannot remove the filter drawer. So what I'll do is I'll make sure that they're basically 90 degrees off from the, uh, the screw here. And you can see that I'm basically uh, using elastic bands here and there to attach the cables and hope that we're going to get um, star shapes that are not too terrible. Uh, we'll see what that gives us, but that's basically how I'm uh, going about it. Now you may be wondering what filter I am going to use with this because I'm in Tokyo and I love to image in narrowband. And plus, I really like narrowband filters that are very narrowband. And if you've watched some of my videos or you know about narrowband filters, you know about a phenomenon called band path shift, which occurs when you have very fast focal ratios like I would be having with this setup. So what I've done is that one, I've ordered some um, ultra fast, ultra narrow band um, filters from Batter, where they provide like 3.5 nanometer to four nanometer band passes that are good for telescopes at F2 um, and up to F3.5, uh, I believe, which is great. And another thing that I've done is that I've noticed that there is a brand called Altair Astro that makes a dual band narrow band filter um, for uh, color cameras and they say they use a technology called flat top that uh, makes band pass shift much less significant uh, than with other similar filters. Yeah, I bought the, uh, the filter, um, ordered it from Altair Astro directly, I paid for it for a change. And um, yeah, we're going to use that and I'll be comparing that on my F2 system with the Optolong L Extreme because this is a dual band narrow band filter in H alpha and oxygen 3, 7 nanometer band passes just like the Optolong L Extreme. And in theory, if this flat top technology works well, we should be seeing some differences between the L Extreme and this particular filter. So we'll see whether my purchase was in vain. <laughs> I'll just a repeat for a filter that I already own. But here I have it attached to my filter drawer. And now we are done. We have the equipment. I really need to get um, to build a dew shield so that not only I can take flats and protect it from dew, but also at the top of the dew shield, I'll be able to have like a, a cover to really protect the corrector plate here from dust. This is really a cool looking uh, telescope and I, and I really like 
<laughs> what I see here. We'll see how well it does under the stars. Now, I'm not gonna do that in this video because it's a long enough video already. And also, watchers need to realize that I'm not a guy who cares a lot about star shapes. So uh, my opinion might be super positive, uh, but uh, maybe your criteria for star shapes are different than mine. But anyway, um, I'll still do follow-up videos, of course, with me using it under the stars and seeing if collimation is necessary. But otherwise, that's pretty much it for this uh, video. So thank you so much for watching, as always. Um, if you're new to the channel, welcome to the channel. Um, if you like astronomy, astrophotography, you may want to consider subscribing down below and clicking that bell icon. While you're there, feel free to leave a comment about tips and tricks for me to use this Hyperstar uh, setup. That's a 300 millimeter f2 setup that's so cool and um and also a like or dislike on the video just to tell youtube um to notice this uh this video um and uh yeah that's uh, pretty much it little telescope say goodbye to everyone bye bye <laughs> and uh yeah as always the most important don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and i'll see you next time